with that, I'll introduce our first speaker. He's the keynote speaker. Um, this is Professor Iran Segal, who's joining us from the Weizmann Institute. Um, now, I guess many of you will know Iran from his work um, over many years, um, working on personalized nutrition. Um, he's done fantastic work in that area. He's also recently branched out into COVID over the last few years. He's a busy guy. Um, but today, he's going to be talking to us about uh, some of his work on personalized nutrition and the microbiome. So with that, I'd like us all to greet Iran and say welcome to the stage. Thank you. Okay, um, good afternoon and uh, thanks Ellen um, for the kind introduction and uh, invitation to speak here today and share, uh, share the work that we've been doing. Um, I decided to give you a, a somewhat broader overview of the work that we do that goes uh, also a bit beyond the microbiome, but uh, obviously I'll focus on uh, a lot of the microbiome insights. Um, and so as a computer scientist um, by training, um, I really relate to this um, um, quote from Benjamin Franklin, where really the investment in, in data is a really uh, key and big investment, and that's where we put a lot of our uh, efforts in, and hopefully I'll convince you that by collecting massive amounts of very unique and very uh, deeply phenotyped uh, cohorts of, 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 uh, of uh, humans, uh, we, can, we can learn a lot, gain a lot of insight, and build a platform uh, that we can take to uh, make further discoveries on. Um, and I think one of the biggest uh, motivations for what we've uh, been doing is actually uh, the Human Genome Project, which, uh, as you know, um, uh, uh, resulted in the publication of the first draft of the human genome about um, 20 years ago. And uh, this, I think, really jump-started uh, the biology uh, in the modern uh, era. So if you think about what happened in the past uh, 22 or something years, since the publication of the human genome, we went from knowing the involvement of uh, just a few um, uh, genetic variants for a few diseases to now knowing the involvement of hundreds to thousands of different genetic variants for virtually all human diseases. So, so this, was, this is an incredible gain of knowledge. But I think you'll also agree with me that uh, the Human Genome Project by itself falls very, very short from solving all of our uh, problems. And one of the key reasons is because the human genome um, doesn't take into account anything about our lifestyle and environmental factors and uh, exercise and nutrition and, uh, right, it's just the initial blueprint uh, with which uh, we are born. And for that reason, uh, we and many other researchers uh, for the past uh, several decades have been working to add to the human genome uh, data uh, multiple other layers of data that we have within us and uh, within the environment and how the uh, interaction goes on between the environment and us. And broadly, we call this uh, the other types of omics data. And people have been looking at uh, the microbiome, of course, but also RNA sequencing data and the uh, immune profiling and uh, uh, metabolite data and many other types of data. But I think that um, most of these uh, researchers working uh, in the field have been narrowly focusing each time on every one of these omics uh, separately. And so uh, we asked the question, what would happen if we were to take a large group of people and on that group measure everything that we can and go very, very deep on a large set of people? And uh, I think that uh, the, the hypothesis was that if we were to do that, then um, we'd be able to learn much more um, because if you think about disease, long before clinical symptoms arrive, there has to be um, uh, some signature of that disease coming up in any one of the different omics layer, any one of the different molecular data, that if we were to measure that on healthy people before they develop disease, we'd be able to detect that and therefore we'd be able to predict disease ahead of time. We'd be able to find some of the causal markers so that we'd be able to, in some cases, maybe many cases, intervene and change the trajectory that people on are, would be on um, developing disease. Uh, we, be, because we'd be measuring things on people, we'd be able to uh, personalize the treatments to people, and hopefully all of this will end up lowering, significantly lowering the cost of drug development, which has been really prohibitive um, um, and cost now in the billions of, of dollars to, to make. So uh, this is the idea behind a project that we started several years ago that we call the Human Phenotype Project. Um, initially, we called it the 10K project for looking at 10,000 people, but now uh, we're going uh, much beyond, as I'll uh, mention uh, later on. And the idea is to build a very large cohort of people, but one that we go and profile very, very deeply. 
And so there's um, three layers uh, to this. There's the, the data, which we actually call a library because a library uh, has also the connotation of knowledge and not just raw data. On top of it, we build a computational platform that allows us to access the data and cleans up the data. And then on top of that, we can uh, look at many different uh, um, uh, applications that I'll, I'll talk about. And I, uh, we're hopeful that all of this will take us to really the next generation of uh, precision medicine. So this is not just a vision. This is a project that we started uh, in the lab about five years ago. Uh, we call it the Human Phenotype Project, and uh, we think of it, as I mentioned, with these three different layers of the library, the access and the applications. Um, and by now, we have uh, actually, this slide is uh, somewhat outdated. We have over uh, uh, approaching 10,000 participants. We follow them longitudinally. Every two years, they come again to uh, the clinic that we built at the Weizmann Institute, and, um, and we profile them uh, again uh, there. So. We have over uh, 30,000 years of uh, human years that we've been, uh, we've been uh, uh, tracking. And this is really a, a full stack uh, project where we do everything in the lab from um, recruiting the patients, building the website that they start to interact with, and then the clinic that they come to visit and get sampled at the Weizmann Institute, and then um, the lab which automates all the sample handling and uh, high throughput uh, handling of all the different omics layers. And then of course the core is the data analysis uh, that, uh, that the group is doing to uh, obtain insights from, uh, from all of this. So uh, with this, uh, I believe that there could be uh, many different uh, um, applications, of course, uh, medical ap applications, pharmaceutical applications, but also educational and uh, various uh, social applications that you can uh, build on top of this data. So, uh, so what is this data that we're, uh, we're collecting? And so every uh, participant that comes to the Weizmann Institute undergoes a series of, of, uh, of, of tests, which uh, broadly we can divide into three main categories. On the right are all the clinical and physiological tests that we're doing. On the left at the top, we have all the uh, omics uh, that we're measuring, and then uh, we also have biobanking of samples. So in terms of the uh, clinical physiological measurements before people come in, they actually um, give us all of their uh, medical history. So we get their uh, electronic health records. We have all of their uh, historical blood tests. Uh, then uh, they do, uh, we use ultrasound to look at fat in their liver. About 30% of the adult US population has fatty liver disease. We use the ultrasound to also look at the carotids for cardiovascular health. Uh, we use a DEXA machine to look at full body composition and bone density. For uh, looking further at cardiovascular health, we use uh, EKG and ABI, which measures difference in blood pressure between the arms and the legs. Uh, we take high resolution images of the retina that allow us to look at blood vessels at high resolution, which is also a window to the heart. Uh, when people go home, we send them with uh, various sensors, including a continuous glucose monitor that, that we used before, but uh, we use this now uh, to track people's uh, changes in blood sugar levels uh, for two weeks. Uh, during that time, they log all of their uh, food intake, so we have their uh, full logs of uh, dietary intake. Uh, we also give them sensors to track their sleep quality. These are sensors at the grade of a sleeping lab that were never applied to such a large population of thousands of people and definitely not coupled with all of this other uh, omic information and physiological information that we have. So, uh, so we really have analog measurements of sleep quality, sleep architecture, uh, how much uh, time people spend in light sleep, deep sleep, REM, and so on. Uh, we know all of the medication that people are taking. Uh, we have hundreds of uh, questions that people fill out on medical background, uh, lifestyle, uh, medical history, uh, family history, uh, and we have all of the uh, current and past uh, diagnoses of people. So uh, coupled with all of this information, we're doing pretty much almost, um, I would say, all of the uh, known omics technologies that we know as a community to do at high scale, scale and reasonable cost that could be applied to this cohort. And this includes a full human genetic sequencing, um, oral and gut uh, microbiome. Uh, we do uh, metabolomic measurements from the blood, probably one of the most exciting measurements. We can look with mass spectrometry at thousands of different metabolites that circulate uh, in our bloodstream. Uh, we are planning on doing uh, proteomics. Uh, we developed a novel assay to look at the, to profile the immune system, whereby we synthesize hundreds of thousands of antigens of our choice. And then with phage display, we take the antibodies of a person from their serum, 
we identify which uh, antigens these antibodies bind, and then with sequencing, we can identify in a single experiment that we multiplex across 100 people each time, we can identify which of all of the hundreds of thousands of antigens are bound by a person's antibodies. And so if you will, and we published several papers on this, uh, this can give us the entire infectious history uh, of a person. Uh, and we do uh, RNA sequencing from, um, uh, in bulk from uh, PBMCs. We also biobank uh, PBMCs and uh, serum and soon uh, urine for any future uh, tests that uh, we don't even know that exist uh, right now. So um, as far as I know, um, I believe this is uh, perhaps the most, um, not the largest, but perhaps the most deeply uh, phenotyped uh, cohort that allows us to really assess the relative contribution of any one of these components to any human condition that, uh, that we look at. So uh, the baseline cohort uh, that we build, um, um, as I mentioned initially, uh, we have a baseline healthy cohort of people in the age of 40 to 70 when we recruit them, um, and, um, and we follow them longitudinally, and then alongside with that, we collaborate with clinicians to build uh, various disease cohorts, and we have about 2,000 patients in various disease cohorts, including cardiovascular disease, several oncology cohorts, um, a non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, and uh, atopic dermatitis, multiple sclerosis, that's not here, and, and several others. Um, and by comparing, uh, by, by having access to a very deeply profiled and very large healthy cohort, this allows us to shine light on even small disease cohorts, as I'll exemplify in, um, in a few minutes. So, uh, so this is a, a busy slide that I won't go into the details, but I just want to impress on you that even when we recruit a healthy cohort of 10,000 people between the age of 40 and 70, they still have many, many different uh, conditions. So, uh, you know, they have migraines, hypertension, many others. They're taking a lot of, uh, a lot of drugs. Um, there's a lot of abnormalities in various blood tests, uh, triglycerides, you know, every, every uh, marker that we look at there's gonna be abnormality. So even at the subclinical level, people who are, let's say, not yet defined as a diabetic, there's still gonna be a lot of variation. And the big insight for me was that you can actually study disease even in a healthy cohort because you can take uh, any marker, which is a, uh, there's a continuum, and even at the subclinical level, you can try to study what uh, correlates with the variation that you see in that clinical marker, even at the sub clinical level, and the advantage is that you're still looking at naive people that are not affected by, uh, by medication, uh, for example. Um, so so that's, that's kind of the core uh, data. On top of that, uh, we build a, a platform that allows us to uh, really access um, the data and, um, uh, and clean up the data, and, uh, and, and, uh, uh, um, and, and soon we will actually make this uh, platform available and I believe there will be tremendous interest because if we look at what happened to the UK Biobank, uh, which I think is one of the most um, amazing uh, large-scale uh, human cohort uh, studies, um, uh, this, this study has about half a million people also tracked longitudinally for over 15 uh, years right now, and tens of thousands of researchers have been working on this with thousands of different papers, a lot of uh, different citations, so a lot of very interesting science coming out of this. But, uh, and I think our data set is uh, very complementary in the sense that it's fewer people, but it goes much more uh, deep in terms of the uh, omics and integrating everything uh, on the same cohort, which uh, does not exist uh, um, in the UK Biobank. So, um, so on top of this uh, 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 platform, uh, we uh, actually can do uh, many different uh, applications. And, and in the remainder of the talk, I wanna show you, uh, to talk about some of the discoveries that uh, we've been making uh, along these. So um, the first one I want to focus on is our therapeutic applications, obviously in this conference, that um, are driven by the microbiome. Uh, before I talk about that, I want to tell you about a uh, large-scale project that we just uh, published where we actually created, um, I think, the, most, um, uh, the newest and most comprehensive human micro microbiome genome reference set. Uh, and we were able to do this because we had access to over 50,000 uh, metagenomic samples, which is much more than uh, what exists uh, publicly and also uh, much more than previous efforts uh, to build this uh, were done on, uh, uh, I think, uh, um, incredible efforts by Nicolas Segata and, and colleagues. But uh, using now uh, 50,000 uh, metagenomic samples and following similar methodologies to what uh, they developed, so taking each sample, assembling 
uh, genomes that we can from there, and in addition, using nanopore sequencing to uh, go on several dozens of samples very, very deeply and also circularize uh, many genomes, we were able to build a much improved uh, reference set. Uh, there's a paper that we published in uh, Nature Communication uh, earlier this year where you can see all the validation of why uh, we believe this is a, um, an improved uh, reference set. And when we did that, we also found uh, a lot of novel uh, microbiome um, uh, genomes and species, so in total 310 novel species. Some of them are actually species that are quite common. So uh, the most prevalent uh, novel species that we found is, is uh, present in 15% of the sample. So it's, a, it's, a, um, it, it's actually a prevalent uh, um, uh, genome. Um, and a lot of the genomes, over 1,000 of these species that we found are uh, not in uh, existing databases. So, so this is the reference set. This is, uh, by the way, the reference set is, is publicly available for academic uh, uh, research. And uh, this is the reference genome set that uh, we are uh, working on uh, with all of our uh, microbiome projects. So, um, so the first uh, line of work I want to tell you about is uh, a line of work that uh, we believe will eventually take us to developing novel uh, probiotics for various uh, human uh, conditions. The first two that uh, we focused on are for type 2 diabetes uh, and weight loss. And what we've done is to develop, uh, as I'll show you in a moment, a novel discovery platform that we could do because we had access to a very large set of samples. Um, once we identify strains of interest, um, another advantage is that we have access to the cohort on which the samples that we took, this is our cohort, and so we can go back to participants that harbor the therapeutic strains uh, that we believe we have identified. We can bring them back in, take samples from them, isolate the relevant bacteria, and then eventually build uh, and formulate consortiums uh, from them and uh, test their efficacy for whatever indication we're looking at in human clinical trials. So this is the trajectory that we're gonna go through. And um, uh, we believe that we can do this also uh, very fast because once we isolate bacteria from healthy people, uh, we can go directly into clinical trials on human. We don't have to go through uh, animal studies because we've isolated them uh, from humans so they would be uh, regarded as uh, safe after um, various uh, other testing that we do. So, uh, so what is this uh, discovery platform? So uh, we start as usual with metagenomic samples that we map to a reference uh, genome set, the one I mentioned before. But now, instead of just looking at the composition of bacterial species, which is what uh, we and others have been doing until now, uh, the access to a cohort of 10,000 people allows us to go much, much deeper and not just look at species composition, but really follow what has been done in uh, human genetics to look at genome-wide association studies and do this for what we now call metagenome-wide association studies where we go to the level of uh, looking at variation that exists at the single nucleotide level at individual species and correlate that variation with some trait of interest. So uh, what's the idea? The idea is that we map the metagenomic uh, reads as we did before to uh, the reference human genome set, but now we record the variation that we see at every single nucleotide position at every bacteria. And then the idea is, if you look at this illustrative example, obviously just a toy example of three samples, but you can see here that the individual at the top has an A at this position and a BMI of 31 compared to a T at this position for the two other individuals and a much lower BMI. So, so this would be a strong association between, that we've identified between variation at a single position at a particular bacteria and a human trait of interest, in this case, um, BMI. So this is obviously a toy example. We do this on the 10,000 samples uh, that we have. And when we do that, we get this, um, uh, what would be familiar to you as a Manhattan plot for human genetics, except that now, instead of the x-axis being human chromosomes, as you're used to seeing in GWAS, the x-axis now are bacteria. And uh, every one of these dots represents a single position at a particular bacteria where we identified variation in that position correlating significantly with BMI in this case. The y-axis here is, is the p-value, so you can see that the significance of this is uh, way beyond any correction that we did. We find very, very uh, strong uh, signals. But uh, what to me is much more exciting than the strength of the association is actually the uh, size of the effect. So the amount of variability in the trait 
that could be statistically explained by the variation that we see here in uh, SNPs in uh, bacteria. And so, and so this is the same data, but just plotted in a different way as a volcano plot, where now on the x-axis, uh, we have the uh, number of BMI points that are explained by each of these different SNPs. The y-axis is still uh, the p-value. And so what you can see is that there's actually a lot of uh, individual positions at particular bacteria, a lot of bacterial SNPs that explain one, sometimes even two points of BMI. And, and that, can be, that can be huge. So uh, two points of BMI could be 10 or 15 kilograms of body weight that uh, are statistically explained only by a variation in a single SNP in one particular bacteria. And so these, the strength of these signals is actually stronger than the strongest signals that we've been finding in human uh, genetics, uh, even though we've been looking at hundreds of thousands of individuals in human genetics. And to me, that makes a lot of sense because I think of the microbiome as an environmental factor. A couple of years ago, we published work uh, where we showed that there's actually very little association between human genetics and our gut bacteria composition, reinforcing the fact that our gut bacteria really are an environmental factor. And so as such, it's not surprising to me that it would have such a uh, strong uh, correlation uh, with, uh, with uh, BMI in this case. So, um, so this is one way of presenting the data. Um, and then I wanna show you um, just a couple examples of more particular species where we found uh, different strains. So in this case, let's, uh, for simplicity, uh, think of it as the, we have the blue strain and we have the green strain. And when we separate people in our cohort only by the presence of the same species, but just one set of people having the blue strain, the others having the green strain, you can see here on average a difference of about two points of BMI between these individuals. And not only that, but when we look at what happens to them um, uh, one, two years later, we see that individuals that harbored the blue strain, the one that's associated with lower BMI, basically they had no change in their BMI after two years, whereas the individuals harboring the green strain, they gained another almost one point of BMI on average when we looked at them two years later. So, uh, of course, this is not proof of causality. That will have to prove in clinical trial, uh, but I think this gives us more confidence that perhaps really this uh, green strain is giving some propensity for weight gain um, and giving us the hope that if we were to replace this green strain in these individuals with uh, the blue strain, we'll be able to eliminate that propensity for weight gain and, and induce uh, weight loss. Um, and it's not just one bacterial species that we're finding these strains, we're finding it in multiples, uh, multiple ones. So here's another one that uh, we found with a, an average of one point difference in BMI, where also when we look two years later, we see weight gain for those individuals harboring uh, the green strain. So, uh, so we're finding many of these different uh, uh, strains, uh, not just for BMI, but also uh, for other indications. And, and for us, it's gonna be uh, exciting. This is where we're gonna spend a lot of time on, uh, isolating these bacteria, making a formulation uh, such that actually there will be network interactions between these bacteria that will allow them to grow together and go into clinical trials and see if they can induce efficacy for these indications. Uh, another interesting application of all of this approach of MWAS analysis is rather than looking at associations between uh, bacterial variation and the host, to look at interactions between bacterial variation and other bacteria in the gut. So here the idea is that uh, we can actually look at the association between variation of SNPs and abundance of other bacteria. And when we find such associations, these could actually be indicative of new antibiotics that we found that are produced and various toxins that are produced by one bacteria to fight uh, other bacteria. So it's the same pipeline, it's just applied to a different trait, which, which is now a trait of abundance of other bacteria. And in preliminary results, we're also finding here very huge effects, uh, and in some cases recapitulating and uh, identifying some, uh, some known uh, genes that, that produce known um, uh, antibiotics. So this is another uh, area of uh, interest uh, for us uh, that we're working on. Um, now, um, I wanna give you an example of work that we recently published to show you that when you go and uh, actually alter and modify the microbiome of a person, you can get therapeutic uh, benefits. So this is in a, a pilot study that we did, we published um, uh, last year on um, a, a disease of the skin, atopic dermatitis, where uh, we did a pilot study only on nine patients 
but where we gave them, uh, each person was his own control, so they first received two placebo dosings, followed by then uh, dosings of fecal material from a healthy donor. So, so FMTs are, in my view, a very crude way, uh, but just to see that you have an effect, and, and I think the, the next generation way would be what I mentioned, to really isolate and uh, the, the relevant strain so that you can make something that's also reproducible, where you also know what is, what, uh, is actually uh, giving you the effect. But, but nevertheless, when we did the study on um, atopic dermatitis, we could see here even visually, you take a patient in week four, this is after the placebo dosings, where uh, you can very, very clearly see clinical manifestation of the disease, and then um, uh, after two dosings of FMT, you can see clearance of clinical symptoms, and here's another patient, where again, clinical symptoms are uh, very apparent, but then even many weeks after we finished the last uh, FMT dosing, you can still see uh, clearance of clinical symptoms. When our uh, clinicians actually scored the change in uh, clinical symptoms in what's called SCORAD, score of atopic dermatitis, uh, uh, we see that uh, patients start with a severe, moderate to severe uh, uh, SCORAD. After the uh, first placebo dosings, there's uh, really no change in that score. But then all nine patients responded uh, when they were given FMT to different degrees, but uh, on average there was a 70% uh, reduction in, in uh, uh, clinical symptoms which uh, persisted uh, during, uh, during the study. Uh, when we looked at uh, what happened to the microbiome of these participants also with this type of SNP level analysis that allows us to identify strain, um, uh, strain transfer from a donor to the patient because we compare the entire genome of the bacteria and we can see that uh, really there's, um, uh, all, there, there's identical genomes between the donor and the patient for that species. So uh, we can see that uh, before starting the experiment, uh, we have clusters of the three donors, all of their samples are clustered together and the uh, patients are somewhere else in this uh, space reduced to two dimensions by uh, TSNI analysis. Once we uh, provide the uh, placebo, there's really no change in the patients as you would expect. But once we start the FMT, we see dramatic differences, a lot of strain transfer from the donor to the patient, making that uh, patient much more similar, not identical, but much more similar to, uh, to the donor. And this happened to almost every single uh, patient that, um, that, uh, that, that received the FMT. So, uh, so we believe that the clinical benefits that um, the clinicians were able to see were driven by this change in the gut bacteria, and we're now doing this study on a larger scale, uh, and also with the intention of isolating the relevant bacteria uh, to see if we can actually, um, and also to look at metabolite changes and immune marker changes following this, uh, this trial to see if we can, in the end, um, isolate um, a relevant set of bacteria that we can give as a therapeutic for atopic dermatitis. Okay, um, I wanna switch to uh, a different uh, uh, application of, uh, of this cohort, uh, where, uh, which actually um, makes a lot of use of uh, the uh, lots of different, modality, different modalities and very deep phenotyping that uh, we have on this cohort. And this is uh, for looking at biological aging. So uh, what we did here was uh, we first took one of our data modalities. This is the modality of metabolites. So with mass spectrometry, we can measure thousands of different metabolites in the blood. And we use that data and only that data to try and predict the chronological age of a person. And when we do that and we test this on held out uh, data, uh, you can see that there's, uh, there's a pretty good explanatory power so we can predict from just looking at metabolites in the blood, the chronological age of a person. But you can also see that the predictions are not perfect. So for any given age here, the model is predicting still a wide range of different chronological ages. So in other words, the model is uh, looking at some of these 50-year-olds, and when the model analyzes their metabolite data, the model thinks that their metabolite data resembles much more somebody who's five or 10 years older. So maybe their biological age of their metabolites is actually, uh, is actually older, and, and conversely, some of these people have, uh, seem to have a younger uh, metabolite age. And so we asked the question of, uh, if we look at these people that have a higher biological age predicted by the model compared to their chronological age and compare them to people have, who have a younger biological age, are we seeing any health differences? So is it really the case that uh, these people may have uh, accelerated aging compared to uh, decelerated aging 
with respect to their uh, metabolite uh, signatures, and does that have any clinical relevance? And, and the answer is yes, because when we compare these groups of individuals, we see that indeed people with a higher metabolomic age, as predicted by the model, are in worse health condition. They have a higher BMI, higher triglycerides, higher hemoglobin A1C, higher blood pressure, higher cholesterol, and higher uh, liver enzymes. So, uh, so this is, uh, though, on uh, one uh, data modality, and maybe uh, some of these um, metabolites are markers of accelerated uh, biological aging, and maybe in some of these cases, if we were to intervene in them, we'd be able to uh, improve and get clinical benefits. Um, but metabolomic data is just one of the modalities that uh, we measured. We have many more. And so we actually built these biological clocks, if you will, from uh, 14 different modalities that we have here. Metabolomics is, is one of them, but we also have the DEXA and the sleep and the blood tests and diet and anthropometrics and, and so on and so forth. And from each of these, we we're actually, actually able to build a, a statistically significant biological clock. In other words, uh, build a model that explains significant variation in uh, the biological, in the chronological age uh, of people. Interestingly, there's also a difference between males and females. Typically, our ability to build these clocks are better on females than in males. I'll give you some insight of that, on that in a moment. But uh, the idea is that now we have 14 different uh, clocks. And the first question we asked is, is, are these clocks related to each other? And interestingly, the answer is that they're only very loosely connected to each other. So we only find very, part, very partial correlations between one biological clock and another. In other words, if your metabolomic age uh, seems older, it doesn't necessarily mean that your biological clocks as measured by these other data modalities will also uh, um, uh, be older. So, uh, so in other words, uh, you can think of it as we're looking at different body systems and each of them is aging at a different pace in each individual, and it's not necessarily the case that all of them are correlated, so it's not that people age um, on, on all clocks together. They may age on some, but not uh, on others. And uh, interestingly, we also find that there is clinical relevance to these uh, biological clocks, because when we ask the question if, um, of um, uh, what disease associations do we find when we correlate biological age of one a biological clock with various diseases, we find that the, um, the disease that typically gets associated with one biological clock makes a lot of sense because it's coupled to the model system on which the clock was built. For example, if we look at the CGM data, which measures glucose levels, we see that individuals that have a uh, higher, uh, um, higher CGM, high, higher blood glucose levels, these people tend to typically have diabetes. People who have an accelerated uh, microbiome age tend to suffer from uh, various gastrointestinal related diseases. Uh, people who have a higher um, age according to the liver ultrasound typically have non-alcoholic fatty liver disease and so on and so forth. So these biological clocks uh, really have clinical relevance. And uh, then, of course, some of these associations are uh, quite novel. And then finally, we also find a difference between uh, males and females. So in males, the clock seems to uh, deteriorate somewhat linearly across the age span of 40 to 70. But you can see that in women, there's actually an abrupt change right around the menopause age, a little bit over the age of, uh, of 50. Um, and so if, if you look, this, this is the one built, built on metabolomics. What it means is that right around uh, menopause, we see a major change in the metabolite levels uh, of women, something that, of uh, some phenomenon that we don't see uh, in males. And when we look at it um, uh, kind of more, uh, more deeply and cluster the different metabolites, we can see different behavior with respect to age and also different behaviors sometimes with respect to males and females. For example, this cluster of metabolites here uh, at the top represents metabolites that don't really change with age, whereas we have uh, other uh, metabolites that seem to, uh, for example, not change with age in males, but do change in age with females. And again, uh, the big change is right around the, until menopause, and, and then there's no change uh, right after, uh, after that. So, so I think very interesting um, markers, both of aging and also highlighting differences between, uh, between males and females. Um, so I mentioned before that in addition to the healthy cohort, we're also collecting uh, disease cohorts. And, and by working with both of these data sets, we can take even uh, individuals that have some disease and, and shed a lot of light on, uh, on them when we compare them 
uh, to the healthy cohort and find by that various disease biomarkers. And uh, we've done that for uh, several di different uh, diseases. Before I show you some of those results, I'll tell you the main tool that we, uh, or one of the tools that we use for that is based on previous work that we did where we asked the very basic fundamental question of uh, what actually drives changes in various metabolites uh, in our blood. So um, uh, in other words, we know that a lot of the metabolites that circulate in, in our bloodstream um, and, and you know, by reaching circulation, they would have a major impact on our health and disease. And if there were some metabolites that we knew were causal for some disease, we'd really like to know what factors determine their levels because then we'd be able to intervene, for example, in their microbiome or in their diet in order to alter levels of these metabolites and by that hopefully affect um, health and disease. And so <clears throat> what we've done is to take the very large um, healthy cohort that we have and look for uh, associations between the levels of each metabolite and all of the different data modalities that we have. So by that, we could really um, compare the relative contribution, the relative statistical explanatory power of levels of each metabolite from the different data modalities. And when we did that, this is a paper we published a couple of years ago in Nature, we found that um, it's really the case that you can partition metabolites into some metabolites that are really uh, determined genetically by host genetics, other metabolites that are uh, determined by diet, you know, a simple positive uh, example or levels of caffeine are determined by how much coffee you drink. Uh, and, but then many other metabolites, hundreds of different metabolites that are actually mostly determined by different levels of uh, bacterial species. And we can even identify individual bacterial species that best explain each and di every different metabolite. So if some of these metabolites, again, were metabolites that we'd like to modulate uh, their levels, the way to do that would be to uh, change the relevant uh, determining factor. And in some of these cases, these would be actually gut bacteria. In other cases, it would be the diet. And genetics, of course, uh, could be in other cases, but that's much harder to, uh, to modulate. So, uh, so equipped with this um, type of uh, information, we can now go and shed light on various disease cohorts. So for example, work that uh, we published last year in Nature Medicine uh, was work that we did on a cohort of acute coronary syndrome patients. And the idea here is that we can take even a single patient and by accessing the healthy cohort, we can take, for example, a 60-year-old male who had a heart attack uh, and then tap into our healthy cohort, extract 60-year-old males who are healthy, um, and then compare the metabolite levels of this patient to the metabolite levels of the, of, of the right reference for this person. So this would be the personalized reference group, healthy reference group for this, uh, 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 for this patient. So you can, you can build kind of your expectation of what should be the level of each metabolite from the right reference group for that person. You can then see where the level of the metabolite, that particular metabolite of the patient falls and how much standard deviations that's away uh, from the norm, uh, the right norm for that person. You do that not just for one metabolite, you do that obviously for all of the different metabolites and what you get in the end are all of the metabolite deviations that are personalized to that person as compared to their proper uh, reference group. So now that we have these metabolite deviations, and based on the work that I told you before of, our, of what are the determining factors, we can cross those two together and say if the metabolite deviations for these patients are mainly driven by changes to diet or changes to gut bacteria or changes to or genetics uh, or based on traditional risk factors. And indeed, when we did that, um, and this is all in the paper that I mentioned, uh, we see that even though we have two different individuals presenting with the same disease. In this case, uh, both had a heart attack. Uh, when we look at the underlying factors, we can see that in some patients, um, it seemed that um, maybe microbiome differences in that patient drove the metabolite deviations, whereas in another, it would be the diet, in another, it would be genetics, in another, it would be a combination of, of, uh, of all of these. And so in my view, this also tells us why when we give the same medication to patients, it never works uh, for everybody all the time because the real determining factors vary uh, between, uh, between people. So if somebody's microbiome seems altered, uh, maybe it'll be uh, less effective uh, to treat them with a diet that, at least a diet that doesn't alter the relevant gut bacteria and so on and so forth. 
Um, in other work uh, also uh, that we published last year on multiple sclerosis, this is an example where uh, we actually found, um, uh, uh, we found evidence on two different layers of data that gives us confidence that a pathway, a bacterial pathway that we identified may be involved in the pathogenesis of uh, MS in this case. And so in this case, uh, we found uh, indole propionate, which is known to protect neurons from oxidative damage. We found that both the levels of, its, of the metabolite in the blood was lower in uh, MS patients. And also the gut bacteria that produce one of the precursors to this metabolite were lower um, in MS patients. And so this gives us confidence that, and also what we know about this, uh, this metabolite, that, that this is a relevant bacterial biological pathway and that maybe uh, we could intervene either by providing directly the, the metabolite or uh, better yet, actually uh, supplementing with the relevant bacteria to produce uh, precursors that, uh, that are just not produced as efficiently and as much in uh, MS patients. Uh, in this case, uh, we were also able to take our uh, metabolomic signature, our immune signature to also separate MS patients from uh, healthy controls and another way of looking at uh, various biomarkers. Um, this is another example from a study that we did on IBD patients, 150 patients, where um, here the power of the approach is that we can take only 150 patients, but going into a very large healthy cohort, we can extract 10, on average, 10 healthy, pa healthy individuals for each patient that we analyze, and then do an analysis of the microbiome that is not just on 150 patients and maybe another 100 healthy controls that you would have recruited, but actually on 1,500 people because we've matched every individual to an average of 10 uh, healthy individuals. And when we do that, we get very robust microbiome signatures uh, that are uh, almost uh, perfectly predictive of IBD uh, versus healthy controls, uh, and also identifying uh, some, some expected uh, markers like a uh, increase in, um, in, in E. coli, um, in the microbiome, gut microbiome of IBD patients, also an increase in human reads that we find in, in the stool, indicative of more shedding of epithelial cells in IBD patients, and also much lower in general bacterial richness and diversity in uh, IBD patients. So again, the idea is, is, to, uh, is to really uh, um, um, uh, get a very, uh, tap, tap into the healthy cohort to really get very robust analysis that are done on many more people than is uh, typically done, and, and I think by that extract um, much more robust results. Um, in oncology, uh, we have a very, um, a very wide, broad uh, program on looking at uh, various different oncology cohorts. These are in different stages of, uh, of collaboration and work. Some are already at uh, analysis stages. For example, in pancreatic cancer, similar to what we did with IBD patients, we can also uh, match uh, uh, four to one, in this case, four healthy controls to every uh, individual uh, patient and also obtain uh, robust uh, microbiome signatures uh, by that. Also, uh, similarly for uh, GI cancers, also in this case, uh, almost a four or five to one uh, match with uh, healthy controls and, and get um, also uh, robust, uh, uh, robust signatures. Um, for breast cancer, uh, looking at the microbiome, um, we can identify a robust microbiome signature, in this case also a 10 to one match to healthy control. So analysis of 100 breast cancer patient, but together on 1,000 uh, women uh, together and find here also lower bacterial richness in breast cancer patients, uh, lower production of butyrate. Butyrate is a short chain uh, fatty acid that is known to provide uh, clinical uh, and metabolic benefits and, and lower levels of some uh, particular bacteria. Um, and then finally, in uh, the context of breast cancer, uh, we also uh, are in advanced stages of completing an interventional clinical trial. This is a clinical trial where we intervened um, in the diet. And the reason for doing that, and specifically in breast cancer uh, patients, is because 75% of breast cancer patients are uh, hormone receptor positive, and so they receive endocrine therapy, which has benefits, but is also known to have a side effect of inducing weight gain in a large majority of the women. And, and this by itself has health complications, but also causes many of the women to stop taking the, uh, the therapy. Um, and so there's really uh, utility to, to try and, and, and address this, uh, this weight gain. And so um, we uh, used previous work that we did of developing algorithms, um, uh, diet um, 
uh, algorithm-based uh, diet based on clinical data and microbiome data to design a clinical trial, randomized clinical trial in breast cancer patients where we randomize them into uh, either a um, standard of care diet, a Mediterranean type of diet, or our um, algorithm-based uh, diet. And we do this intervention for, uh, for six months. Uh, the trial is not over yet, but uh, we're getting very encouraging results in the sense of not only do we not see weight gain, but we actually see weight loss. There's no significant difference between uh, the two arms in terms, of, uh, in terms of weight loss, but when we look at the CGMs for this woman, so when we look at um, blood glucose levels, here we do see significant differences in that the algorithm diet, which really targets blood sugar levels, this, this is uh, what we developed uh, several years ago, uh, we see much lower uh, levels of blood sugar levels in these uh, women who are on the algorithm-based diet compared to the standard of care uh, Mediterranean diet. So, um, so with that, um, I want to kind of pop up uh, a level and tell you that um, we believe that everything I showed you, and I didn't have time to share with you all of the different discoveries and, and insights, and obviously there's many more that could be uh, discovered with this uh, with this data set that we just uh, don't have the the brain power or manpower or expertise to, to do. But I think this gave us a lot of evidence that um, in fact there is a lot of utility from and, and a lot of discoveries that could be extracted from large human cohorts that we uh, phenotype uh, very, very deeply. And so our mission is now to really try and find ways to scale up uh, this, uh, this project on multiple different axes. So on one axis, we really want to increase the number of people, go beyond 10,000, go to 100,000, even more. Uh, we also want to go in the dimension of adding even more data types. So even though uh, we've been profiling very, very deeply, obviously we're not doing all of the tests that could be possibly done. Um, all of our work so far has been in Israel. So even though Israel is a very um, genetically and, and uh, environmentally uh, diverse in terms of uh, cultures and, and so on, um, uh, still it obviously doesn't tap into um, all of the ethnicity and uh, cultural differences that exist in courts in the world, so we'd really like to expand this uh, also uh, geographically. And finally, although uh, we're, we've been collecting cohorts of several diseases, we'd like to cover uh, more diseases. So these are different uh, axes that we'd like to, um, to expand to. Uh, as I mentioned, we, do, uh, we have all of the capabilities that we developed uh, in-house from uh, the very basics of, of just building the cohort, recruiting it, all the systems and infrastructure to uh, bring patients and streamline, streamline them uh, through, uh, through a clinic. Uh, through the actual clinic to uh, collect results, the lab where uh, we've been spending years to automate and lower the cost and increase the throughput of our ability to uh, measure these omics. Some of, the, uh, of these are proprietary assays like the immune assay I mentioned, and uh, of course then the core is our ability to, uh, to analyze uh, this data. Uh, we are also looking to, as I mentioned, expand to, uh, to different geographies. So uh, what we'd like to do, and we have um, a few partnerships that are being set up right now in various uh, countries is we'd like to uh, take the uh, technologies uh, that we have in all of these profiling and even setting up uh, cohorts and, and uh, collaborate with researchers who are interested in building similar cohorts with some variation um, uh, in, their, uh, in their region and basically use this, um, use this um, capability and platform to, uh, to save a lot of time and money for people who want uh, to build this. And uh, we believe that um, within six to nine months from establishing uh, uh, such a collaboration, we can begin to recruit patients and build cohorts in, uh, in other places. Uh, so uh, hopefully uh, with all of this, I convince you that uh, this type of data could really take us to building the next generation of uh, precision medicine. And uh, this has been and will be our mission uh, for the coming years. And with that, I want to just put um, the maybe most important slide of the, uh, my group at the Weizmann Institute, so all of the different uh, wonderful uh, students and postdocs and researchers who've uh, contributed and really uh, driven this work. And with that, um, thank you for your attention. Happy to answer any questions. Very much, Aran. That was a fantastic talk. An amazing data set. Um, yeah, I guess keep watching this space for decades to come. There's going to be lots coming out. Um, okay, has anyone got any questions for Aran? Um, I can see for <laughs> the light right in my face. Um, please stick your hand up and we'll get a microphone to you. 
Oh, sorry, there, yeah, I really can't see, sorry, I'm blinded. <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, it was a really nice talk. Uh, I just have one question on the strain relation with uh, BMI. Have you tried to look retrospectively or prospectively if there is any clinical uh, factor or dietary factor that basically drives this strain? Or to some extent, this strain can drive a specific physiological effect or pathological effect in the person you are looking for? So if I understand, so we've looked, uh, I think it's, um, I showed results that are both retrospective and prospective. So. So the main discovery that we do is on the baseline cohort. So this is cross-sectional, and this is kind of retrospectively, we compare the BMI cross-sectionally of people to uh, the microbiome and identify strains. But we've also, since we follow them longitudinally, we look prospectively at what happens to their change in weight given their baseline strains. And I showed some strains that we identified that when you look at what happens to these people two years later, the strain that was associated with higher BMI, those individuals who harbored that strain also had an increase in weight compared to no change in weight to those individuals harboring the strain associated with low BMI. So, so that's also a, a, a perspective uh, analysis. But ultimately, we are gearing up to, uh, to doing actually interventional uh, data that is the only way to prove eventually causality and that uh, replacing these strains or providing these strains to people would actually uh, really causally induce uh, benefits in this case for, for weight loss. Okay. Can I, can I follow up briefly on that? Because yeah. I had a similar question. <clears throat> so the causality, as you said, is, is really the key thing to establish next. Um, when you do these association type um, analyses, do these strains, the green strain, as we call it, and you've called it in the talk, does it associate with other confounders that might also explain the change in BI? Yeah, so that, that's an excellent question. So. Uh, so we actually do a lot of other analyses that I didn't have time to go into where we um, use independent and other data to convince ourselves, again, as much as we can from observational data that we really have causal strain. So we try to eliminate many other confounding factors. So we actually, when we do this analysis, uh, we don't just do a microbiome to BMI analysis, but we integrate other confounders like uh, age and uh, gender and in some cases we can even put dietary patterns in, and then we make sure that the signals that we're finding are actually beyond what would be explained by the confounder. So, so this is one way that we do that. And then other ways are um, also to look at, um, look at metabolite outputs of the strains that we identify, which is uh, data that we haven't even used to uh, extract the strains in the first place. And if we find that those bacteria that we identified also produce metabolites that independently in the literature or through our data also show associations to, uh, to, to weight, uh, then we feel more confident that this is other external data that is also associated with that. So, so we, you know, we, we try to use all the information that, that we can. Um, and I think the richness of the cohort allows us uh, to do that, to gain more confidence that uh, these are most likely are going to be strains that are causal. That's great, thank you. The question here at the front, yes. I think, can you hear me? No, we need the microphone for the people joining us online, sorry. <clears throat> thank you, Ryan. great talk. And yeah. I wanted to ask you about the SNPs, and I, I'm sure it's on your mind, but um, you didn't talk about it too much. The SNPs can not only be a tool for getting a a stronger correlation, but also to try and get to mechanism. And if you got an indication of mechanism, you might get an opinion on causality from that. Do you have any examples of that? Yeah, we actually have, yeah, so that, that's, a, that's also an excellent question and, and also relates to Alan's question. So th this is also additional data that we use. So we don't have the, we, we never looked at the identity of what gene a particular SNP is located within when we did the initial identification, but then after we identify the associations, we can ask, are these genes um, known to be related? And, and um, I think it's like when you do GWAS on humans. In some cases, we look at the gene and we know this is a gene that uh, breaks down some complex uh, carbohydrates, and then that gives us confidence that uh, maybe, yes, maybe a mutation, maybe a different variant uh, of that gene identified by the SNP really makes sense for, uh, for something that would affect uh, uh, weight loss. Um, and, and, and then, that builds, a, builds us more confidence in the robustness of that particular SNP. 
In other cases, we, we don't find, uh, we, we find the gene, but there's no um, obvious connection to the trait that we're looking at. Doesn't mean that it's not a true result, but then at least we, we don't understand it yet. So absolutely we're going into looking at the genes um, that harbor uh, the SNPs, and in some cases it does give us some uh, mechanistic insight and then even more confidence that we're, we're on the right track of uh, what we, in terms of what we found. Yeah, I'm gonna give people online a chance to ask some questions. Now Rita has some questions. Is it yeah, possible to get the microphone for Rita, please? I've, I have a microphone. Oh, you've got one, here. sorry. So this is, that's fine. Yeah, there are a couple of questions related to FMT um, from the audience online. Uh, first of all, uh, what criteria do you use for selecting FMT donors? And the other one, uh, also related to FMT, is that how long does the beneficial effect of FMT on uh, ato atopic dermatitis patients last? Does the AD patient microbiome gradually revent back to its original composition? Yeah, so um, with respect to which donors we select, I think that's still an open question uh, in the field of who are the best donors. We selected, in this case, just uh, young, healthy individuals between the age of 25 and, and 35. This is just what uh, we happen to do in this uh, study. Doesn't mean that this is the best choice, but this is what we used. Uh, and then in terms of the uh, lasting effect, this really varied between people. So in some people, we even saw uh, some improvement, but then exacerbation of the disease, which treated again with FMT resulted in improvement. And in others, we saw improvement lasting for uh, even 20 or 30 weeks uh, later. So this is also, uh, this is empirically what we see, and I think is an interesting uh, question to understand uh, uh, what explains that uh, personal response variation in patients. Another question is, uh, kind of, um, what are your thoughts on using an artificial intelligence or machine learning to in interrogate this huge and very informative data set? So using, I mean, a large question, but. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I mean it, my expertise is in AI for the past 20 something years. I mean, I think AI is a big word for basically, you know, statistical data analysis. So, so <laughs> these are the tools that, that we're using here. Yeah, good. I have one more question from the room here, if that's all right, if we can get the microphone. Right, so I have a question about uh, this um, human gut microbiome reference set that you have. Uh, so have you done functional annotation of all those marks, especially those no novel uh, species in general that you discovered? Y yes, we have, and that uh, if you access that uh, data, then, then you have, uh, you have, you have gene function predictions for all the genes in all the 3,000, 3,500 or so uh, genomes that we published. Yeah. And how, how many of those are still like unannotated? Well, uh, still, uh, I don't remember the exact number, but still a large set. And I would say even those that are annotated, you know, these are just prediction tools. And many of the, in many of the cases, the predictions would not be the right ones. But this is, this, is the, this is the state of the art of what we know how to functionally characterize these genes at this point. Uh, quick question, because you touched a bit about the eventual aim of developing these consortia or specific strains as novel LPPs. So that's something also I'm both very interested in. So if some of these turn out to be very strict anaerobes, you know, do you have strategies in mind for how you might get these into people? You know, these are not things that lack the bacilli that will sit on a shelf for a year. And right, fine. right. So, so I think there's been also a lot of, uh, a lot of developments in, in knowledge of how to, how to isolate and then also how to grow and how to, uh, how to provide some of these uh, anaerobes. So we'll be, we'll be using these types of uh, technologies. And, yeah. Great, okay. Um, Jerry, you, unless there's anyone online, Rita, Jerry's got a question. And then we should wrap up. Maybe last question, Jerry. Sorry for time reasons. What if there's someone else? What, what, Does anyone else want to jump in instead of Jerry? <laughs> it looks like the floor is there Jerry. Are still some oh, online yeah, some questions also, also, but yeah, I'm really sorry, people at the back. I cannot see for the light right in my face, so I'm very sorry. Can I ask one from the audience? Yeah, please do, Rita. Yeah, yeah. Uh, how much you correlated different variants of dementia with omics, including the microbiome? Different variants of? Uh, with dementia. Oh, dementia. Um, we don't have uh, uh, dementia patients in this court, so we, we haven't done that work yet. Actually, how long do you, that this <laughs> continuing oh, for me, the, how, the long do you, how, how long do you plan to follow these patients afterwards? So, or so not people, patients, people can stand for 25 years. Uh, the people who have been longest in the court have already been there for a bit over four years, so we, we continue, we, we plan to continue. 
I will say we have, we have I think, interesting ideas for how to look at uh, even traits that we haven't even measured yet, and this is by using genetics. So we can import polygenic risk scores from genetics to isolate people, segregate people into high risk versus low risk individuals for uh, Alzheimer's, you know, for various other diseases that have not yet developed in this cohort, and then uh, associate those different groups with all the different omics that we're measuring. So this is one interesting strategy uh, where uh, that allows you to transfer a lot of knowledge in the literature to uh, also shed light on markers that may precede development of these diseases in people that don't have them yet. But we, we haven't gotten to these analyses, but this is a, an idea for a direction. That, that will be amazing. Looking forward to it to see yeah. how it goes. That's probably a good time. To, I'm going to try and keep the time. That's now is at 2 o'clock. So um, there's now a five-minute comfort break factored into the schedule, and then Rita will take over as chair. Um, I'd just like to thank Aran once again for thank giving you. a fantastic talk. Uh, really kicking off the conference well. Thanks so much. Thank you.